We're going to talk a little bit about wildlife today and um, it means different things to different people. Hardy people here, wildlife, different people. So, uh, whatever you do magically to thin those, let it go. So, you see this picture, does it look like wildlife to you? Anybody? Is it wild? Is it living? Yes. And the broad definition, anything alive and not being domesticated or tamed in some way by people would be wildlife. One way of thinking about it. But I think for most people, this would not be your image of wildlife. I suspect some of you know what this is, but I have since I have taken that picture never seen a field quite like that. Beautiful snowy field full of what? Exactly. <laughs> Tooth of the lion, don't be on. So, this might be more of what you're expecting for wildlife. Especially big, charismatic animals that you might have an encounter with that you might feel a little bit worried about. In fact, people often define wilderness as a place that you could go where you have a chance to be eaten. <laughs> Well, black bears don't go around eating people typically, but they are animals, like we are. And we do unpredictable things too. So people would not be interested in me telling them that our biggest, most dangerous, fearsome, unpredictable animal in Lecherse Park is the human being. They would rather see this. So that is for all those that would rather see that, because we are what I just said. Now, your eyes may not be the same as mine, so if at any time these look too bad, just let me know. So we train these animals to mow our lawns. We say it's on gasoline. It is a rodent. If they do not chew their feet, can't be sharp. That's why they're called the gnawing mammals. And if for some reason their teeth misalign and don't get chiseled nice and sharp, they go right on five. I once found a woodchuck, somehow it was still eating, but the tooth had gone right up around and back into its skull. Misalignment. That's why we go to the a particular doctor to get our teeth better aligned. It doesn't do us good if we have too much caricature. So, cartoons. You'll hear uh, sometimes how lovely these animals are. Chip and Dale. The cartoon. Chipmunk's not the talented boy. Uh, <laughs> but look at that left ear. That is a domestic argument, <laughs> the size of one other's chipmunk's mouth. <laughs> Rodents come in many forms, but not many people get a chance to see this rodent. One lovely evening, it was raining like this, a little bit cooler. We were out looking at some frogs in an abandoned channel of the Genesee River, and out of the tree, in this flying squirrel. Not this particular one, but one like it. Many times we see something furry and small running around. We're thinking mouse or rodent, but this is not. In fact, people tell me that they need to kill these in the garden because they are eating up their plants. This is not a plant eater. They are not on a vegan diet. They're insectivores. Their food is moving and alive. So they're not eating up your tubers in the garden. This, in fact, is a star nose mole. It's designed for digging. Look at those shovels. <laughs> See those great big eyes? Not useful underground. It does not have great big eyes. I tried best I could do. But no, it wouldn't go down. 
And for you, no force. Thank you, Bernie. So, 22 projections on the end of its nose is how this animal navigates, finds its food, knows what's around it. They are very sensitive. Imagine what you could do with 22 projections around your mouth. This looks like a rodent, but it can fly. They're in a whole other order of mammals. In fact, our only mammal that can by itself fly. Well, although we try in many ways to be able to fly, but mostly we take on mechanical advantages, which I highly recommend if you haven't been in a hot air balloon ride yet. Totally a different view from up above. Anyways, our bat populations have been crashing. Uh, white nose fungus syndrome uh, spreads uh, in a cave during the hibernation. The temperatures are just right for growing the uh, spores of this fungus. And some of our bat hibernaculums have been wiped out 90%. This was already a wet summer. Already we had enough mosquitoes, but without our vacuum cleaners of mosquitoes and other creatures from the sky, you might have noticed a few more this year. We haven't gotten certain extinctions yet, but many of the populations have dwindled incredibly low. 90% from just uh, 10, 15 years ago. Now, how many have seen this lovely animal? I saw some on the way in, they were in these beautiful spots. And they love their environment. Like us, they need food and shelter. Like us, when we get too many of us, we have an impact on our surroundings. So you, in fact all of us, could go outside right now and walk through that woods for the rest of this program, and not one of us would find a tree between knee and shoulder high. Because they're 100% gone from year after year of deer eating up to seven pounds of twigs a day per deer. It has an impact. If you hadn't seen an understory with wildflowers, ferns, and small shrubs and trees, looking out there, it looks quite lovely. You can't miss what you never saw. And has, this isn't a quick thing. This has happened over decades. We can't fix this easily. Because the animal that ate deer, we killed to extinction. We are coming up with technologies that are capable, possibly, of bringing things back by splicing things together. Our manipulation of our surroundings. We always want to try to get the new best fix. So, who you knows? Maybe the deer wolf will be brought back. The closest thing we have to it right now is the coyote. And that's because our eastern coyote has the genes of that wolf in it. It is almost twice the size as the western coyote. The closest living relatives that are still around of the deer wolf or northeastern wolf was not the timber wolf, which likes bigger deer, such as elk and moose. The deer wolf very similar to the red wolf. How many here have ever seen a red wolf? Awesome. I expected no hands to rise. Did you see it in the wild? No. Okay. They are almost extinct in the wild. So it's the Mexican wolf. But those are the to two closest relatives to the northeastern wolf that was here. We didn't know that it was a different wolf until fairly recently because in our museum there are study skin with the pelt and we can do DNA stuff. You can send your DNA out and get it sampled and find out that we've got Vikings in me or whatever it may be. We are really getting good at trying to figure things out when we look down into the small. And it's hard for us, it's hard for me, to think how small things can be. It's easy to think about infinitely big. But in theory, there's also infinitely small. All right, think about it. So let's go back to animals. This mass bandit, someday, 
some camper is going to tell me how this animal got keys out of their pocket, opened up the car, got the cooler out, got the steaks out, prepared them, ate them, and left. <laughs> they are very good with their hands. They've always seen the one take something down to the water, manipulate it a little bit. So we're walking along streams, the rivers, great places to see the tracks of this massive band. Yes, we have predators here. Uh, the red wolf is not here. This is red, but you know it as the red fox. We have uh, the gray fox as well, and sometimes in the winter we see it climbing right up in the tree. Sometimes it's referred to as the cat dog, the gray fox. Well, that's what I'm going to talk about mammals. I think mammals are the first thing because we are mammals that we might think about with wildlife. But I want to turn your attention to some other animals that have backbones that share some characteristics with us. Internal bone structure. Their bones are lighter, but still, which is heavier? A ton of bird bones or a ton of feathers? <laughs> They're going to be the same. But compare the same bone in a bird to a mammal, and you'll notice how much lighter they are. You see those turkey vultures? Think they're big, six foot wingspan. But they'd be lucky if they haven't eaten recently to weigh four pounds. Now, if you have a vulturine diet like myself, you might see something you want to eat, and you just keep eating, and then you can't even get up. <laughs> Sometimes the vultures will have a very hard time getting up off the road, where you might see them feeding on their favorite TV dinner, <laughs> prepared by the sun and decay. Years ago, I could ask a group of people, how many people have seen our state emblem? Raise your hand. I figured more hands would go up than that. But years ago, hardly any hands went up. They didn't see these birds around. But with DDT out of our system, sort of, um, a lot of the things that depend on bugs that we were trying to kill with our poison are able to flourish a little better. But notice this animal likes cavities. And what do we do with cavities in trees? Well, the tree doesn't need to be cut down. We need to make firewood out of it. And do you see fence posts made of wood much anymore? or some fiberglass or plastic or steel. And so their home space has also gone a little bit less than it used to be. But through programs such as what we have here in the park, we provide nest boxes, and we've been able to raise in over three decades over 1,000 bloopers. And along with that, tree swallows and other cavity nesting birds. You want to be in charge of hope? <laughs> Maybe that's as good as it gets. Huh? So, could you use the microphone, please? Yes, I can. <laughs> Will I? <laughs> Make it work. I'll use it. Come on now. Yellow warbler. We have many neotropical migrants that uh, live in Central and South America that are only up here for the summertime because they get something here that they can't get back in their home, and that's more daylight. It had been dark since 6 o'clock if they were back home. Look, there's still light out there. And when the leaves come out, there's a whole bunch of things that are tasty for insect-eating birds. That's promising. Uh, so, what do you think? You like the new improved loud voice? Thank you, thank you. You are welcome. So, hooded warbler, perhaps our most common warbler, very rarely seen. How many here have ever seen a hooded warbler? How many people here have never heard of a hooded warbler? Uh, that's what I expected. Yet, yeah, they're common here. There may be as many as 400 pair 
of hooded warblers nesting in Letchworth State Park. In fact, there's probably well over 3,000 individual pairs of warblers nesting in Letchworth State Park, belonging to a couple dozen species almost. So let's look at a few other wood warblers. The butterflies of the bird world, the American red star, the black-throated green warbler. We will lose this species if we lose our hemlocks. It might be better called the hemlock warbler. They love our ravines. That's where you're going to find them, where the hemlocks are living. But the hemlock woolly adelgid is here. I've been to the Shenandoah. I've seen where hemlocks were. And now I walk bathed in the heat of the day in a ravine full of raspberries, blackberries, and goldenrod, and the dead skeletons of hemlock. I don't wish that upon us, but they do kill them. So, you may know the black-winged redbird by a different name. How many know the name Scarlet Tanager? Oh, that's more people than warblers. It's a little more charismatic. And so, too, are the rose-breasted grosbeak, and the Baltimore Oriole, some of our most colorful songbirds. But who has seen this brilliant blue bird? Two people? Three people. Okay. Once you learn their song, you can find a lot more things. The indigo bunting is common, and it's right near here, this building. But will you hear them singing at this hour of the day? Not so likely after the rain. The indigo bunting, is that really indigo color? <coughs> Pretty funny story. Person at the office had an A, was asking people there, oh, what's this? And I overheard, and I said, well, that's a great blue heron's A. Where'd you find it? Oh, just up the road. Up the road. <laughs> sure enough, went to the spot, looked straight up, here in that, above the road, in a Norway spruce. Since then, I have found that many of our herons have taken to these plantations of evergreen trees. And they can be above a busy road or parking lot, and no worries. No one sees them. They don't see anybody. They got their world. They're all good. Adaption. It's a wonderful thing. Here's our turkey vulture that I mentioned. And maybe they're not so pretty for you, but for <laughs> other vultures, they're pretty awesome. And if you look at their head, no two are patterned the same. The patterns of red and black and white. And there tends to be less feathers with age. In fact, they may be some of our longest lived birds. We recently had a, a bird that was banded, a, a, a bald eagle, that was banded in the 1970s and was recently found dead. And so, do the math. That's getting on. But vultures are believed to live 40 or 50 years or more. Also, like the eagle. And so sometimes they're here in the winter. But even when they normally return on the Ides of March, they may be greeted with snow. So where do they live? Their nests, they do not build. They find a cavity that is hidden or secluded in some fashion so that all the rotten putrid food that they feed their young will not be drawing predators too easily. So that usually means inside a hollow tree, a log, a crevice in the gorge, maybe an abandoned building of some sort. Can you see the baby vulture? Well, it's right next to its unborn sibling that was still breaking out of the egg. Right there. So why is it called a turkey vulture? Well, it looks a little bit like a wild turkey, I guess. But wild turkeys don't weigh four pounds. You know, a good turkey dinner weighs a lot more. And of course, our turkey dinners, we pump them all up with all kinds of stuff to make them even juicier. In fact, we think we like white meat, which does not exist on a wild turkey. They use their muscles. They are dark meat, even here. 
predators. Here's a predator you can imitate. We've imitated this predator and have been able to get them coming close. We do that in the evening when they're out about. They're kind of crepuscular, act of dawn and dusk. We have some crepuscular walks. They may not be called an owl prowl, but perhaps we'll find one nonetheless. So see if this sounds a little bit like the word, who cooks for you? Southern trout who cooks pretty well. <laughs> but that is the barred owl. And that sound carries so far in the forest that they often respond. It's my territory. I'm coming over here. So what's going on? They're a cavity nester. So you need bigger trees. You won't find this in a young woods. You need bigger trees. Uh -oh. Was that someone just falling on the floor? <laughs> if it was my great aunt, she just fainted. But check this out. This is a picture. <laughs> These are not snakes. A picture. <clears throat> now the next time you're filling out a crossword puzzle and they want to know the name of an egg-laying animal that gives its young live birth, that would be ovoviviparous. Store that away for the next time it comes up in a crossword puzzle because garter snakes are that. In fact, uh, this actually was a mating swarm in the spring. Um, females in there somewhere, and the males are interested to see if, uh, if they could um, be able to mate with it. We have many kinds of snakes. Look how beautifully lined this is. It looks a little bit like the garter snake, born as a garter. You don't see people wearing nylons and garters much anymore. That's where the name comes from. It's not garden snake, it's garter. And this one's a ribbon snake. And I think you can come up with its name. Red-bellied snake. And its favorite food are slugs. You don't like slugs in the garden? Put a few boards out, places where things can crawl underneath them. Maybe you'll be lucky enough to draw in a slug remover, such <laughs> as the red-bellied snake. Beautiful animal. This one just shed its skin, that curly iridescence, rainbow-like colors you see on the body is because of that. And it's named for that band around behind its head, the ring neck snake. Hard to see. Has anyone here ever seen a green snake in Ledger State Park? Um, that would be no one. And I've only seen, um, well, about as many as I have fingers. And it's not because I was looking for them. It's because they move. If they're not moving, you're not going to see them. That's a serious camouflage. So, yes, those are my hands. And that is a snake that I'm holding. But it, I'm not in any particular danger, even though it's a constrictor. If the snake was big, such as I, it would be able to swallow that slide projector without hands and still breathe. Constrictors are amazing that way. This one does not climb up the leg of a cow and milk it, but they are found where cows may be in pastures and barns. They love eating rodents. But it is called a milk snake. This is banded too, but notice its habitat in the water, why it's called the water snake. A little more feisty temperament. Expect to be bitten if you try to handle one of these. So that's why the head is grass. The teeth can break off. The wounds can get infected. Not a good thing. Yes, we do have rattlesnakes in Lecture State Park. Most of them are the black phase. Recently, out in the wide world of imaging digital stuff, we got advertisement of a beautiful yellow phase. Uh, they're pretty rare here in the park, and many of them that we've been able to track down were actually illegally released snakes because someone was coming down to capture them with the evidence, and they said, oh, there's something in Lecture, let's release it and they end up releasing their 
captive snake that they stole from somewhere else. And that's one of our biggest threats, people coming into the park, taking the snake. It's illegal to do. And people just driving the road, a rattlesnake is a laid-back animal. If it's really serious about crossing the width of a road, it's going to take about two minutes. And that's if it's motivated and really wants to do it. <laughs> They're not a high-paced animal. And so that's where 99% of the encounters people see is a snake crossing the road. You see that thing on the end of its tail? That's to warn the big clumsy things like us, leave them alone. They don't want to get stepped on. Their venom is for capturing their food, it pre-digests it, it dissolves the muscle proteins a little bit, and it has an organ between its nostril and eye, which allows it to see sort of in infrared. It's pretty amazing, the pit viper. So it can track down that animal. No one, to my knowledge, has ever been killed by a timber rattlesnake. Yes, there's other rattlesnakes and people have been killed by them, especially the eastern diamondback and the western diamondback and many other species. But as far as I know, no one's ever been killed by this animal, but they have been killed almost to extinction. Does anyone know where Rattlesnake Point is? Does anyone know Rattlesnake Peak? These are places in Rochester where there used to be rattlesnakes but they've been eliminated by people. So there's only a few places remote enough without as many people where they can still hang out and have their three-course meal, which isn't every day. It might be three meals in a month. They don't have to eat as often as we do. Here is that yellow fade. We have a snake that can get as long as a person can stretch their arm, and it can climb trees. And when it's coiled, it can move its tail against some dried leaves and even sound a little bit like a rattlesnake, and even puff itself out and it looks a little bit banded. But it doesn't have a pit between its eye and its nostril. It is not venomous. This snake is a constrictor, like that milk snake. And yes, it can get up in a tree and get eggs and birds and other things that other snakes may not be able to get. But no, you don't have to worry about what's going to fall on me. But there it's doing what it does. So, uh, we have moved from birds to reptiles. Sometimes people think the dinosaurs just became birds. Some people think there's no such thing as extinctions. They just move on and succeed to something else. Whatever, it may be more philosophical than uh, our program deserves. But here is another reptile that has legs. Reptiles have claws, but it still has scales. You may know this is a painted turtle. <clears throat> you may know this is a snapping turtle. And you notice my hand is not near its mouth. <laughs> they can go right through a broomstick. It is a powerful grip. But some of the best uh, capturers of snapping turtles use their bare feet to walk into the pond because they apparently don't bite when they're underwater. Tell that to the next duck that's swimming by its mom and all of a sudden, yeah. <laughs> and on she goes. Here is a wood turtle. Don't see them in often. This one was over 30 years old. We found it at the bottom of a cliff. Its shell had been broken. We could see organs inside. We took it to a person that knew a little bit about plaster and pots and pans from the clay industry. And they fabricated some tissue. And this was a year later on its release back into the wild. Again, my fingers are not near the front end. This animal does not have a shell that it can climb into. Therefore, it seems to have kind of the nasty temperament. And it can reach right around almost to its back foot. Hence, my fingers behind the back foot. This is a soft shell turtle. They don't get real big. A female could get as big as a slide projector. Various uh, 
stink pots and mud turtles that you don't see um, have reputations of climbing up in the vegetation. And as you're battling along, you hear a plop as they drop off the vegetation back in the water. One excited canoeist had to drop into the canoe. <laughs> I am now moving from reptiles. I've left birds and mammals behind and I'll introduce you to another vertebrate, the amphibians. Amphibious way of life. They're born in water. In the water, they're vegetarians. They leave the water, they become carnivores. Completely different diet. This one with a nice mass lives in the forest and why it's called the wood frog. One of the first to I started calling. Can anybody here pluck a little bit? Pluck, pluck, pluck. Go ahead, try pluck. Pluck, 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 pluck. You just made a forest of wood crop. Good job. Was that fun? Let's try making a forest of spring peepers. They don't do so much a peep as a little whistle. Try this whistle. got another job later on. <laughs> now this is the male. Their little throat here is dark. So the pouch, which is its skin, when inflated looks dark. So you can tell a female if you pick it up, they'll have a white throat. They are small. They're than the end of your thumb. That last digit on your thumb. Here's another one that you may not hear too much because it's not so common around here. It's at lower elevations, about 1,500 feet, and our highest spot in the park is around 1,400 feet. They seem to disappear. They like a little lower elevation. And they don't like ponds or creeks or rivers so much as they like a flooded field with grass. And a lot of our fields are plowed with corn, sword beans, so we're becoming less of them too. This is a chorus crop. More the sound of uh, those small teeth on a comb. Does anyone use a comb? <laughs> so I'm not going to be able to borrow a comb right now. Three, three. So we have uh, some frogs with spots. We saw one with spots the other day. Notice the spots on this one, particularly on its leg there, how round it is. And then see these spots more rectangular. They look pretty much the same, but this is a pickerel frog, and this is a leopard frog. I grew up with fields and small pastures and cows, and leopard frogs being eaten by great blue herons out in the field. Today I see none of that going on. Ponds are gone, land's not in the meadow, it's plowed up. So I don't see them as much. They seem to like bigger bodies of water, and so mostly we have the pickerel frog. And what we saw, um, I was careful to wash my hands afterwards because they have a mucus secretion that is strong enough to kill other frogs if you put a pickerel in a jar with others. You just end up with pickerel frogs. Not pickled, <laughs> pickerel. So this is a toad. Toads have one of our longest songs of amphibians. It's a long trill. I don't know if you can show. That would be an American toad. Again, the male doing all that song. And if you're lucky enough to see their eggs, they may be in a cluster, but if you look closely, there are two strings all kind of folded up. So this is bumpy like a toad, and that's why they sometimes call it a tree toad. But it's actually related to the spring peeper. But its color is extremely variable. They can change their color a little bit like a chameleon. If you put a light one on something dark, over many, many minutes, it will darken up. So sometimes they come around the lights where uh, insects are attracted. You might find them on your house uh, sticking to the window. It's not that they're really sticking. Their feet have so much texture to them, they feel how rough the glass is climb up the rough ladder. Come up here, I'll tell you. I haven't named yet, because I'm going on with my story a little bit. 
So that's okay. It's a gray tree frog, hyla versicolor. Notice how the fingers are all hidden by the fold of its skin. That gives the extended circumstance of it looking like a lichen on the bark of a tree. Camouflage. Well, I thought it'd be fun to try to train one and turn on and off the light on. <laughs> so I meticulously would put mealworms up on the light switch, figuring, oh, it would go up there and pull the light switch down and get the mealworms. You know, it just crawls up and bites the mealworm in its mouth. But it was worth a try. <laughs> Notice that big circle behind this frog's eye it is quite large. That tells you it's a male. They like to hear what's going on. Bull frogs and green frogs both get pretty big and can eat other frogs and eat salamanders. The salamanders, like the frogs, have their larvae in water from eggs. And this is probably one of our most commonly seen salamanders because it's big and bold and spotted, but not so commonly seen except in the spring when they go to their breeding pools that they were born from. So if something happens to the pond that they were born from, many years later when they go there to lay their eggs, they don't have a place. And that population will there be gone. So the spotted salamander. Notice it takes two hands to hold it. They're a big salamander. So guys, the Jefferson salamander and the blue spotted salamander, sometimes you'll find several species using the same pond in the spring. This is not so much a pond species as it's a stream or river species. And it's voracious. It'll eat anything it can capture, including its own kind. And this spring salamander, or purple salamander, if you think that color is purple, may eat this salamander. Notice this salamander has its tail longer than its body. If you are swimming away from someone that's going to eat you, what is he most likely to get you by but if your tail? Your tail snaps off, it gets food, you get away, and because you're a salamander, you grow a new tail. This one's original tail. It's not regrown. You can usually tell there's a little bit difference in color. But imagine once we crack the ability of how they do it, when we can get that toe fixed, we should go one right out. The dusky salamander is in the stream. There's another look-alike, the mountain dusky as well. And they sometimes even like uh, steeper rocks, like right on the face of a waterfall. But of all of our salamanders, this is probably actually the most common. Some people that have studied it have found that there's more biomass in a given area with this species, the red-backed salamander, than any other animal utilizing that same space. And I say, what? You're telling me there's more red-backed salamanders out there in the woods that weigh more than one deer? And they say, yeah. That's a lot of salamanders. You don't see them. They don't go to ponds to lay their eggs. They lay their eggs in rotting logs, under stones, under uh, things that are molding on into the leaf litter. You may see this animal because it doesn't care if you see it or not. It's brilliant. It's bright. It's out. It wants to be seen. Because it's poisonous if you eat it. It's a very important ingredient to witch's brew. I have nuked. <laughs> they are poisonous. In an experiment, a drop of extract of new skin applied to the skin of a laboratory rat killed it. They think, why well, should it have so much toxin? Some say, oh, it's to protect them in the water when uh, bloodsuckers would kill them. That being said, I have caught them in the water with bloodsuckers on them. Anyways, do not lick them. <laughs> I was talking to you about animals that have backbones, and I neglected to talk to you about fish, because I had no pictures of fish. But how many people here are fishermen? Really? Just three people. How many people have had fish to eat? Oh, okay. Then you know what fish are. I'm not talking about it. But we have about 50 species of fish that live in the river. 
And if you want to talk more, ask a question at the end and we'll put in some more fish information. But I'm going right on to all those animals that don't have backbones. We call them the invertebrates. And one of the stars known in all the languages of the world are butterflies, Metaposa in Spanish. This is one of our larger ones. On the cover of the Genesee Naturalist, some of you have it, it's one that's even bigger called the giant swallowtail. This is the eastern tiger swallowtail. And when the Danes rock it, it's in bloom. Some people think it looks like flocks, but it only has four petals. That's a good time to see them in late June. We usually get a few of them on our butterfly count that we do on the 4th of July. And this year we got them as well. Very few of these butterflies, their larvae, feed on thistles. And so whether it's the Painted Lady or the American Beauty, um, their larvae are where you find thistles. And you say, ah, I didn't even get rid of the thistles. No, you want a butterfly? Good thing they have around. The Red Admiral, some of you may remember just a few years ago, had a major incursion moving northward. So numerous were they, you could stand and in that much time see one, or two, or five. Flying up. In fact, the numbers that they were showing would indicate that there were not ten, not a hundred, not a thousand, but more than ten thousand being killed by cars on roads in New York State per day. There were a lot of them moving through. Maybe you didn't see them. They're small, only a couple inches. This is the Red Admiral. They belong to a group that have these camouflage underwings. Can you see uh, a punctuation mark on the hind wing? So one is called the comma, one is called the semicolon, one is called the question mark, all depending on the marks that you have on the underside of the wing. There are a group of butterflies that frustrate butterfly watchers, just like warblers can frustrate bird watchers. There's so many, so confusing. And these are the skippers. We have a couple dozen species of skippers that have a skipping flight very quick need to perch so you can see not only their underside of their wing, but it'd be nice to see their top. But these don't spread their wings very often. So you've got to work at what you can see. This is a, a beautiful butterfly we usually see on every uh, butterfly count that we do in the early part of <coughs> July. But how many people here have ever seen the Baltimore checker spot? They're pretty common if you're in their habitat, which is a wet meadow. A calcium rich meadow, even better. Uh, you might even call it a vent. It might be things like marsh fern or uh, some of those water loving horse tails. Same thing. We have a baby looking pretty much like us. For many insects, they have a baby that looks pretty much like them and it grows up and that baby is called a nymph. But for many insect individual species, only four groups, they have a, another stage which is called the pupa. And their larvae look very different than the adult. They just don't look like baby adults without wings. And that's the case of butterflies. Egg, Larva, which we call caterpillar, pupa, which we call chrysalis, and then the adult, which we call butterfly. Can you think of another group that has four life changes? How about a fly? You see house flies? They have larvae. What are their larvae called? Maggots. Uh, maggots. Isn't that a great word to say? Come, let's say it with you. Maggots. Maggots. Are you sick? You feel sick? <laughs> So, is this a hummingbird? I thought we left conversation about vertebrates. No, this is not a hummingbird. This is a moth. But what better name to call it than a hummingbird moth? It's one of the clear-winged sphinx moths. 
you know sphinx moths, they're like the tomato sphinx on your tomato hornworm. So this is a, a vacuum cleaner of insects that is an insect. This is a dragonfly. We'll have a walk here later this week and we'll look at some dragonflies up at the trout pond. Over 30 species have been seen there over the years and we may find a dozen or more. We were there on the weekend and we found that many. They won't be around if it's raining though. They love the sun. They think even a cloud goes over, poof, go back and land in the vegetation. So, white tail, pretty easy name to remember. So is this the 10 pot spotted skimmer or the 12 spotted skimmer? Who is up for counting spots? This side of the room, count the white spots. This side of the room, count the black spots. All right, go. They're still counting. How about you're still counting? Um, how many white spots? Ten. Ten. How many black spots? Twelve. Twelve. So the name for this, depending on whether you see white spots <laughs> or black, is the ten-spotted dragonfly or the twelve-spotted dragonfly. No one seems to add them together. <laughs> One of the most beautiful dragonflies up at the trout pond is this calico pennant. And we tried to capture one because we tried to take a net and capture it because you know, a dragonfly in the hand is worth a whole bunch of <laughs> your eyeballs at a distance. You can really see all their beautiful structure, the calico pennant. We were unlucky last weekend, but maybe we'll get one this week. Here's its female. Looks like a different species. Let's go back. See the pattern is pretty similar. Male red, female yellow. The blue dasher often perches right close to where the fisherman is. Sometimes the fisherman might be tempted to eat the dragonfly for bait. And if you look closely out in the water, you see a fish jump right out of the water to get a dragonfly. So even though they're a predator eating other insects, they too can be eaten from the fish from below and birds from above. We had a kingbird one year nest right above the water at Trout Pond and it was just feeding its dragonflies to the baby. It was going down and getting one whenever it wanted to. So here's the eastern pond hawk. Same as the last one. Those don't look the same. You gotta be kidding me. The Little Circe right here at the end of the tail are white on both. Otherwise, they don't look very similar. So this one, when you see the green stage, might just be called the green clear wing or the green jacket. Where is the other? The blue dasher. Use whatever name you like. You're not going to hurt their feelings. They don't even know they're dragonfly. <laughs> Here. What could it be? It has horns sticking out of its head. It feeds on fungus. One day, we're out by the visitor center in the woods we call Bishop Woods. There's a shaft of light coming down through the forest, and it's hitting a tree with mushrooms. And there's smoke coming from these mushrooms. We go over because we were attracted to the smoke, which were spores. It was sporulating. And on the mushroom we saw a bee. And they were wrestling, pushing and shoving. And then in the bark next to them were more of these without horns. This is the male wrestling with others to win king on the mushroom <laughs> and having the right to mate with the females that are looking to see who's going to be the winner. <laughs> and this is going on around us without us even knowing about it. The horn fungus bee. Turns out beetles are our most numerous thing on the planet. One out of five living things on the planet, including mushrooms and algae and microscopic organisms and plants, one out of five things living on planet Earth is some species of beetle. 20% of life, and that's as far as we know so far. Some researchers, where they've taken a whole tropical tree, surrounded it, so nothing could escape, 
and then put in poison, killed everything in there so we could see what was going on. Thought, oh, that's a lot of beetles. And they had estimated from some surveys like that that there might be 30 million species of beetles on planet Earth. And right now, we only have identified about 2 million organisms, period. Wow, a lot of beetles. So you don't see this beetle on the hand, the female's on the left, the male's on the right, and that's because they can cause blister to your skin. That's why they're called a blister beetle. At the office, some people were coming up and they said there were aliens. They're coming out of the ground. You must come down and help us. We're staying in the cabin. We're being invaded by aliens. I heard this. I came up front and they started describing the aliens as being kind of small. And I'm thinking, well, um, so let's go see. We came right down here to the lawn, by the cabins where they were, and sure enough, there were beetles. They were not coming out of the ground. They were females backing their butt into the ground and laying a couple hundred yellow eggs in the homes of bees, where their larvae would be eating the bee. Ground bee. Predator. Short-winged blister beetle. It's part of their lives, a little different than ours. Well, we've talked about some kinds of animals and how widespread they are, numerous. Turns out we might very well be the most widespread organism on the planet if it isn't some disease that feeds on us. And I think it's appropriate here to talk about us in the most prevalent poison, toxin, pollution that we have out there, which is mud from denuded landscape. Go to some of those interesting Google sites where you can look at the earth from above, and you'll see mud cascading out from places on the earth into the ocean. Check out Madagascar, where it used to have a wonderful forest full of lemurs and chameleons, the only places in the world where they are see all that mud coming off the denuded forest. In the time it's taken me to talk to you about wildlife in Letcher State Park, an area the size of Letcher State Park that had never been cleared before is now gone. And that's how quickly we're changing things. It's amazing how quickly we're changing things. So people have imaginations. They, they try to apply their brains to problems. I think we can figure things out. I don't think we have to be constantly take, take, take without giving. And here, here was a little message one day. I was looking at this and I said, oh, that's close. You see that message? I'll take you a closer look. Look down below the fern. There's a, there's a leaf down there. <laughs> Smile. Be happy. We get overrun by some of the stresses in our world. The message is all around you. There's a lot of wonderful things that connect us all together. And yes, uh, there's a ripple effect. You can damage something over here, something else on the web of life is going to be affected. Whether it's the butterfly effect or whether you have some other name for it. I'd be happy to entertain any questions you might have. So, I'm done.